Welcome everyone to our second Cooperation Science Network live stream. I am really excited uh, to be hosting um, this second live stream that we're doing. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the Cooperation Science Network is a group of scholars that spans many disciplines and we come together to understand the fundamental principles that drive cooperation and also the forces that compromise it. Um, we're so excited to have with us today Lee Allen DeGatkin, author of the new book, Power in the Wild, the subtle and not so subtle ways that animals strive for control over others. Um, he's also an animal behaviorist, an evolutionary biologist, and a historian of science, all of those things, uh, at the University of Louisville. Uh, Louisville, sorry. I want no, to say Louisville, Louisville is right. Louisville is right. Is it? Okay, yeah. Louisville. <laughs> so uh, I have to say, Lee, um, your book it was just an amazing combination of super entertaining anecdotes and scholarly science. It was just like an effortless way to get this overview of decades of research on power in the animal kingdom. So I thought it was an awesome read and I recommend it to everybody. It's, um, it's really great. <laughs> Thank you very much. You're too kind. Yeah, the people <laughs> I worked with, uh, the the researchers who were doing the the studies, were incredibly helpful, and it was just it was a pleasure to 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 get a chance to do that. Awesome. Yeah. So, I mean, you've done really foundational work, not just on the sort of conflict and power side, but also on cooperation. So, like, you've written dozens of books on this topic, and I, I read a lot of them like during my graduate training, so you've been super influential for me, and I know for a lot of other people who are part of this community. Um, so I just wanted to pull pull a few things up here. So um, Lee, when um, I was in uh, undergrad and grad school, I read a, a bunch of your work. So I remember cooperation among animals, game theory and animal behavior, just, you know, oh, and of course, model systems and behavioral ecology, who could forget that one? Um, just <laughs> amazing, amazing foundational books um, for the field of evolution and behavior, really. Thank so you. yeah, but that's not all, right? Because you have more books. You have all of these books. You have books that are written for general audiences. You have books that are written for sort of specialty um, audiences that really are more sort of mathematical and technical. Um, you really have, you know, run the gamut in terms of the, um, the the styles that you've written and the audiences that you've written for, which um, I don't know anybody else who's really like been so prolific and like, you know, covered so many different audiences in the work that you've done. Well, oh, thank you. I mean, I, 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 I you know, I, I've enjoyed every minute of it. And yeah, I mean, it was sort of one of those things where my interest just sort of expanded out in ways that uh, I never really would have predicted early on. So um, it's, it's, it's been interesting to sort of delve into lots and lots of things and eventually kind of figure out how they're all linked, um, which wasn't the case when I first started each, uh, every one of them, but now I'm have a better sense. So, yeah. Yeah. So where did you, where did you start? I mean, how did your interest in these questions about cooperation and conflict begin? Well, I mean, so, uh, you know, a, a lot of people who study behavioral ecology, animal behavior, they, they're, um, they can show you pictures of themselves when they were like two with binoculars going out and birding. And they've just always been interested in animals per se. My, my, my background is different. I sort of didn't know what I wanted to be when I grew up, even through undergraduate time in college. And um, a good friend of mine um, was studying animal behavior at Cornell and they gave me um, the textbook they were using. And I, and I just absolutely fell in love with it. And I made a decision that even though I was almost done with my undergraduate work, I, I wanted to study. And that was in history, American history. I decided I wanted to do this. And I was really quite fortunate um, that I happened to make that decision when I was at the State University of New York at Albany. And that's where Jerry Brown um, was. And Jerry is a foundational player in, in, in behavioral ecology. I mean, his book, The Evolution of Behavior, even though it's almost 50 years old, is, is still one of the best books out there. And um, so I was lucky enough to get to know Jerry, take some of his classes, and he um, he let me into the graduate program. And of course, Jerry is um, well known for lots of things, but cooperation is perhaps the one that he's best known for. And um, and so 
you know, we were talking when I was starting my master's and um, he suggested various projects and um, ended up settling on, on, on a project that dealt with uh, game theory and, um, and tit for tat and um, the evolution of cooperation and did some experimental work on it. Um, then I, again, was so you really kind of like took a, a total turn. I mean, you were a his, you were studying history and then you're a behavioral ecologist all of a sudden. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's right. That's right. I mean, it was, it was, um, uh, it was being shown, um, the light. Um, I, I really, so I, I, I was actually at a science and math high school in New York, Stuyvesant, which is Stuyvesant high school, which is a really good high school, but we never really talked about evolution and behavior, at least that I can recall. Mm -hmm. um, and when I when I sort of started reading, it was Alcock's book, and this was maybe nineteen I don't know nineteen eighty three or eighty four. It was like a a bolt of thun lightning hit me. I mean, I was <laughs> like, this is fantastic. And 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 in retrospect, I, I I didn't think about it when it was happening, but in retrospect. I, I realize now that, you know, part of it was here I am. I mean, I'm studying history mostly because I don't know what I want to do, but I still am interested, very interested in it. So I thought, OK, um, but in fact, you know, this is really this the ultimate study of history, right? Studying uh, things from an evolutionary perspective. And so in that sense, it was a jump, but maybe not as dramatic as I used to think it was. Um, Interesting. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and I had that same experience as you of like, like once I got this like evolution, uh, evolutionary approach to behavior, I was like, oh, like finally there's like a framework that we can use to understand what's going on, to make predictions. Absolutely. And I mean, it is like being hit by lightning in a way. It's just like, you know, amazing all of a sudden to have this framework that things can kind of click into. It's almost like if you're, if you're trying to like put together a puzzle, but you have no idea what the yes. picture is. And then it's like, oh, evolution. And then you're like, oh, okay, this piece probably goes here and this one goes here and maybe this one goes here. And it, it's, I, it's totally mind blowing. <laughs> it is, it is. And, um, and, you know, so uh, when I teach my courses in evolution, uh, you know, you can, when you really reach students on this, you can see it's like a light went off. It's all of a sudden they just see things very differently. And you know, I, I, I you know, I myself again was really fortunate because when I finished with Jerry Brown, I went to work with David Sloan Wilson, and David, um, good friend, as is Jerry, and 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 brilliant. And um, uh, it was there, you know, working with David was when um, I really learned that you can study anything from an evolutionary perspective. And David, David taught me that. Um, and, uh, and, and at the same time, also really, we really started working together on, on the theoretical side, th side of things. And that was also eye opening. I mean, before that it was empirical work, testing these models, but building the models, it, it, it it's different. It, you know, you're sort of starting from scratch and you, I think you, uh, you know, you get this, fundamental sense of how, how could this work? I mean, the experimental stuff is critical, but like the models also are because, you know, you, you begin to figure out, you know, sort of step by step from an evolutionary perspective, how, how can you go from not having cooperation to having cooperation or, or how do the dynamics of power work? How do you, you know, is it just animals beating each other up or in fact, is it much more subtle and, 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 you know, you can study that in two ways. One is you can study it experimentally and one is you can study it theoretically. And of course you can do both. Um, and so again- So is that where the sort of impetus for writing this book came from was sort of getting interested in, you know, these different ways that you can study the routes to power and the sort of more subtle aspects of it, not just the like brute force ways? Absolutely, absolutely. So, I mean, one of the things I've always been interested in, I think it, it's, it's one of the- themes that sort of underlie everything I've done from the start is this kind of strategic view of um, animal behavior. And initially that was through the work on cooperation. And then it was actually some work on cultural transmission in non-humans. But then, um, you know, I've done a little bit of work in my on my own and then in my lab with my students on, on power dynamics. Um, and, you know, we might be able to touch on one of those things later, but um, yeah. one of those studies later, but um, but basically, um, I 
got deeply into the literature, um, also partly because I talk a lot about it in my animal behavior textbook. And I began to realize that there really were all of these very complex, um, subtle ways in which animals are trying to exert power. Um, you know, everything from um, everything f from spying on each other to assessing potential rivals in very complex ways to to changing the way you act in terms of power when others are watching you mm -hmm. to power being embedded in social networks. And so I was really fascinated by it. And I thought, you know, it's really time, um, you know, to try and tell this story. And, um, and, you know, I was really fortunate because the people who I reach out to who are studying this everywhere. I mean, literally uh, everywhere, but Antarctica, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, and I wouldn't be surprised if someone's doing it there, but I, I, I don't know. Um, but, uh, but, uh, they were just super helpful in, in, um, helping me fill in the blanks, both in terms of the science, but also in terms of sort of what it's like to do this and how do they come up with their hypotheses and, and go out and test them. So, yeah, I mean, it was sort of a continuation of that theme of, animals are incredibly strategic and selection, natural selection favors um, complex strategies in certain situations and when and how, and power was just a great way to explore that. Great, well, so in your book, you define power um, as the ability to direct control or influence the behavior of others and or the ability to control access to resources. So how did this, definition kind of coalesce for you? And, you know, why does it have both of these elements of the um, controlling behavior and also controlling access to resources? Yeah. So I think, um, you know, it took me a while uh, to, to, to really settle on, on a definition. And um, there were a number of things. Um, so part of it was that, you um, when I was talking with all the researchers in the field and when I was reading the literature, um, that definition really sort of seemed to encompass the main things, the, those two main things, controlling others and controlling resources. Some studies focused on one, some studies focused on the other, some studies focused on both. But that seemed to be a sort of a good umbrella sense of what the people on the ground studying this thought power was. Um, I also think, you know, the more that I studied um, these systems, the more that I, uh, I got the sense that that really was what the an what animals were attempting to do in one way or another. And, and, and there are just this myriad of ways that they do um, that it, that it was, it was, it was really a, a, a nice kind of umbrella definition. Um, the other thing was uh, there's a couple of other things. One of them was that um, it's what, you know, we might call an operational definition. And, and what I mean by that is it's, it's something that um, you can go out and study and measure. So, um, you know, it's going to vary from whether you're studying it in penguins or chimpanzees, exactly how you measure it. But the controlling others and controlling resources, th those are measurable things. You can see how behaviors lead to suppression of other behaviors in, in, in subordinates or, or how, how much food or how many mates you get. So, um, you know, I think we always want to have, um, an operational definition. I think this is one. And then, um, Lee, can I jump in? We have an interesting question here from the audience. Um, Neil is asking sort of, you know, about like the positive side of this influence. Like, can you measure something like charisma in animals where they're like drawing, you know, behavior through positive means? Is that something that um, is, is part of the definition? Is it something that's measurable in animals? Well, Sure, I think it is, and I think you know, in many ways, that's that's the cooperation element of of power, um, in the sense that um, you there are many there are certainly number of instances where the way that um, individuals can attain power is to work with others to get that and to cooperate with others to get that, and and that might be. Um, 
something like cooperating to get access to food or a good shelter, or it might be cooperating to gain power of over other groups that are that are trying to cooperating um, to cooperate. And um, you know, in terms of 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 charisma per se, I mean, um, there are certainly uh, there, there's certainly evidence that um, that individuals um, at the sort of top of a power structure are. In addition to sort of, con well, I guess I would say in, par in part, some of the ways that they control others are by um, not just always suppressing them, but sometimes getting actively involved in breaking up fights between others or helping coalitions form between others. So it's it's not always just a sort of one-on-one -on -one thing, but rather sometimes um, one way that, that you can cement power is to make sure that others um, lower in a power structure are not doing things with each other that might help them rise up and take over your position. So mm -hmm. I don't know if charisma is exactly the right word there, but, um, but certainly um, there are ways in which this plays out where individuals um, do more than simply just suppress the, the actions of others um, to get resources. Yeah, yeah. Well, we have a bunch of other folks to bring on to, to chat with you. But before we do that, I, um, I just want to uh, encourage everyone to check you out on Twitter. You are uh, not just a prolific writer, you're also a prolific tweeter. Um, <laughs> and I love I love following you. So um, make sure you check out Lead Getkin on Twitter. And um, Lee, I have to say, I, I noticed on here um, that you are the curator of the world's finest Do Not Disturb sign collection. Can you tell me about that? How did you come to be the curator of this fine collection? <laughs> well, uh, sure. I mean, so, uh, you know, over the last 20 years or so, I've, 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 I've gone around um, a lot of the world giving talks on various aspects of, of my research. And, um, you know, at some point I just um, started taking these do not disturb signs from hotel rooms because it was a way for me to remember, you know, where I stayed and, and that sort of thing. And so, um, and then- Do you have any examples? I have, I, I do indeed. Um, so I'll just show you a few. So, um, this is one, um, and again, I, I guess I can't quite tell. And you'll notice that each one is actually labeled. Um, I have a tag telling me when I went there and um, and where it was and everything. This one is from Cluj, Romania, where I've actually um, have a number of good friends and colleagues and have talked about um, the, the book I did on the domesticated foxes and various other things. Um, I'll just show you a couple more. This is actually from Copenhagen, which is like a second home to me. Um, and again, I've, I've visited folks at the University of Copenhagen and, 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 and chatted there with them about all sorts of things. Um, here's one from Zagreb, um, Croatia, um, where I talked about the uh, cooperation and also the domesticated foxes and, oh, um, let's see. I'm sorry. That is not from Zagreb. That is from Oslo. This one is from Zagreb. Um, here's one from Taiwan, um, where I have a number of colleagues and talked about evolution of cooperation. And then um, this one, last one is sort of is from Abu Dhabi, where um, I was a couple of years ago giving lectures. And I have far too many of these things, but I, I love them. Sometimes I just lay them all on the floor um, and I remember where I was that way. So are you ever tempted to bring them all to your office and put them all on the door handle? Just be like, really don't bother me right now. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I've <laughs> seriously thought about that a number of times, but I, but I haven't quite done it yet. <laughs> Usually just one, but I really have thought about that. <laughs> Uh, so, Lee, one of the other things that I, I noticed um, from uh, stalking you on Twitter is this. Th so, I mean, I mean, we also see your study in the background, but this is amazing. So you have this like beautiful space. Is this where you write in, in this study? Yeah, so it um, it is and it and and it has been um, pretty much the only place 
I've I've been working from for the last you know since the pandemic struck. So um, uh, you know I do all my work here for the most part. Um, and even before that, I was I was writing a lot um, here. It's a very relaxing um, and, and also um, inspirational place to work. I I mean one of one of my passions is I, I, I collect antiquarian books. And so a lot of these books are from the 1700s and 1800s. And, and a lot of them are natural history and biology. They're, they're certainly not all that, but, you know, I've got Buffon's Natural History Encyclopedia. And um, up there is basically the Encyclopedia of the Enlightenment written by a guy by the name of Pierre Bale. And it, it's just, you know, sometimes I just take one off the shelf and I, and I and I look at you know who were people in that encyclopedia up there thinking was important in 1730, and um, and so you know it, it uh, I, I, I'm 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 fortunate um, I, I I love the space and I do most of my writing here now yeah that's amazing well and it makes me feel better because I know some of us myself included struggled to just write one book and now I know it's because I don't have a study like that. <laughs> You know, yeah, anything, anything that helps is a good idea. You know, anything that, gets, anything that, that inspires is good. Anything that inspires is good. Well, I mean, there's well, also, there's a lot, helpful. there's also a lot to be said for sort of, uh, you know, uh, what you've got in the background there, sort of very nice, you know, it's very white and very, you know, it just, it's very peaceful, very serene, um, you know, clean slate. Clean slate, exactly. What it's you don't scary. know is all of the like uh, perler beads and junk that's back here because I'm at my kid's desk right now because this is like the best place for me to live stream. From. <laughs> so it. yeah. it's not quite the study with enlightenment, um, you know, antique books that, that you've got going on, but that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> but you're in Greece, so there you go. That's true. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, one more Twitter thing, which is we put up a poll um, and we ask people what they thought about whether cooperation can thrive um, when they're in a when we're in a competitive world. And look at this: the winner is yes, absolutely. Um, we had uh, a little bit of votes for conflict prevails, a little bit more for competition encourages it. W what's your verdict here, Lee? What do you think? Uh, so I, I think that um, certainly um, cooperation can thrive in, in a world where, where there's so much there, there's so much in the way of trying to attain and maintain power um, w without question. And I think, um, you know, in, in the context of, in the context of power, I think um, cooperation really plays out in, in these coalitions um, that you see um, all over the animal world um, from hyenas uh, to dolphins to chimpanzees and, and, and bonobos. Um, you know, some of those, some of those coalitions and alliances, they're, they're not really about power per se. So I would argue that if you know, a number of lionesses were working together to take down a large prey. That's cooperation, but I don't immediately connect that to power per, per se. But okay. if you go to Shark Bay and and you go and and you know and and you study the dolphins that um, Richard Connor and Simon Allen and so many people have studied, there you see that the way coalitions work in part is that. Coalitions are att attempting to gain power for the individuals in within them, but they also compete against other coalitions who are trying to do that. And in dolphins, you get it going up to meta coalitions, which wow, you know, it, yeah, I mean, you get yeah. coalitions, you get pairwise interactions between coalitions, and then you even have meta coalitions that take these second order coalitions and bring them together, and they have battles between these meta coalitions. So there's the way I, you know, I think um, cooperation certainly is important. It, it's always, well, I would argue it's always a way to achieve getting some sort of resource. I mean, everything in one way or another boils down to access to resources and, 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 and cooperation is, is one way to do that. It involves being nice to those you're cooperating with, but 
not always to everybody else. And I know we might get into that later too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. Well, I think um, we're just about ready to bring in some of our other discussants. Okay. So we oh, by the way, I, I should, I should yeah. say also, I love the fact that 0% said they didn't know on that. So, so you're, you're dealing yeah. with it. Nobody, nobody who's watching has a, has no opinion about this issue. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody was pretty decisive. So no, 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 no. yeah, absolutely. Um, now, before um, we uh, bring, bring more people on to chat, I want to remind everybody in our audience, please hit that like button, smash that like button. Um, that helps us get the CSN in front of more eyes so that more people can learn about cooperation and um, especially helps us reach students and um, people who might not already sort of know what's going on um, with the Cooperation Science Network. Um, and don't forget to subscribe. Um, then you'll get a notification whenever we uh, have a, a new guest. And um, we love to get those numbers up with our subscriptions to um, that, uh, that helps us reach more people as well. So um, make sure make sure you you hit that like button and, uh, and subscribe. Okay, so now I'm really excited that we're going to bring some more people in to Excellent. our discussion. So um, let's bring our colleague Abe Gibson to chat with us. So Abe is a historian of science at the University of Texas, San Antonio. Abe, it is awesome to have you here with us on the show. So um, tell us, uh, what do you think so far of, of what, we're, what we've been chatting about, Abe? Well, yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm really enjoying the conversation. Uh, it's going well. And um, uh, yes, as you know, uh, or as rather as Athena just mentioned, I'm a professor of history. Hopefully you can hear me. My neighbor has decided this moment is the best time to start mowing. Um, <laughs> let me just say, uh, I teach history of science and technology and that sort of thing. And I, I, I will be the first to admit that historians tend to sneer and uh, maybe make snide, snobby comments. Uh, whenever scientists say that they're doing history. But in this case, I want to say, uh, I want to give props where they're due. I want to give credit where, they, where uh, it is due. Um, because whether you are writing about domestication or mutual rate, excuse me, mutual aid, or my fellow Virginian, Thomas Jefferson, uh, you have really distinguished yourself in no small part because of your rigorous historical research. Uh, it's really, you. yeah, absolutely. It's really impressive. Uh, and I've always appreciated how you recognize and foreground the importance of history. And so you mentioned briefly that you were a history major, but I'm hoping you elaborate and say a few more words uh, about your training in history or your approach to history uh, and how you see its relationship to the biological sciences. Sure. Well, um, I mean, my own history here is that is that when I was when I was an undergraduate, I, I, I was studying American history. It's just always been a passion of mine. And um, and I, I think I sort of learned uh, very early on from that work the importance of of of, of primary documents and 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 the primary literature. Um, no matter what you're doing, um, uh, from from history to to science, um, I think that uh, you know with within. Well, I won't speak broadly for the sciences per se, but I, I can speak sort of for I would say biology to some extent. I think that um, you know there's this. Things things are happening at such a breakneck pace that um, that students in particular, um, you know, think that pretty much everything of interest has happened in the last five years or the, or, or the last ten years, and they um, and 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 I think um, you know instructors are are also guilty of this sometimes um, because there's only so much that you know we can cover when we're talking to students in a in a class on biology. A at the same time, I think it's it's just so important for for students to understand history, um, even even if their primary interest is, is, is science because because it, it shows us that that um, that it's it's never this straight path that that you know it's just as important to understand um, why people came up with the ideas that they came up with as what those ideas are because and even if those ideas don't pan out over time understanding how they came up with them why they came up with them why they didn't pan out what in fact turned out instead that might have in part directly or indirectly been 
because of what was done originally. All of those things, I think, are are just incredibly important. And and so I, um, the other thing I, you know, I I I I've, I've learned is how important it is to um, to whenever it's whenever you can um, to talk directly with the people who who are doing who are doing the work, even even if they, you know, even if those people uh, have done the work 50 or 60 years ago, if they're willing to talk with you and get that, that again, more of that primary side, side of things. I hope that's not my mic making that sound, but um, I, I, I was hearing something, but maybe we're okay. Um, so, um, you know, I, that's what I did when I did Domesticated Fox book. I, I spent time with my colleague who's been studying them for 60 years. But more than that, you know, we sort of cast it in the context of, of what was going on politically, because that's important too. Even, even though as scientists, we're trying to be as objective as we can about the hypotheses we're developing, we're, we're clearly developing them in a, in a political and historical context, whether we want to admit it or not. And to understand what that con what those contexts are is is important for the research you do as a scientist mm -hmm. and also just as an intellectual. Great, thanks. That's awesome. I'm going to bring um, Lee, our other Lee, um, Lee Cronk, in as well. Um, Abe, maybe the mowing will will calm down in a little bit. We'll pull you back in. Um, so, uh, Lee, um, it is great to have you here um, to talk with us more about the sort of broader context of the work um, um, for the evolutionary study behavior. Um, now, you're an anthropologist at Rutgers, um, and you've worked on evolution and behavior for, for decades. So, so what are your thoughts um, so far in terms of uh, what we've been chatting about? For yeah, well, hour? thanks. Thank you. And uh, thanks, Lee, for uh, writing the book and for writing so many good books over the years. Thank I've you. enjoyed reading them and using them in class for many years now. Uh, yeah, um, well, I'll, I'll start with one sort of quirky thing, uh, which is as I was reading the book, I, I was struck by a certain similarity to Machiavelli's The Prince, um, in that your, your your chapter titles are essentially a set of instructions for how to be a powerful animal, like uh, chart a path to power, weigh costs and benefits, assess thy rivals. Uh, I wonder whether that was deliberate or whether it was just sort of convergent evolution. Um, so I, I it wasn't deliberate, although now I kind of wish it had been, but now that I hear you <laughs> describe it, um, I could have done something with that. Um, but I, it wasn't deliberate, um, but I, I certainly, um, you know, it hasn't been that, I, you know, in the last couple of years, I, I did reread the prints and I have been, you know, thinking, um, and, 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 I, and I certainly am, am fond of Machiavelli's work in, in, in the sense of sort of being foundational. And, and, mm -hmm. um, but, but I did not directly come up with the chapter titles based on, Ma on on Machiavelli but at the same time I think you're right that's that that's what they are they're instructions um on how to attain power and 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 I, I let the animals you know teach us that way it teach us in a sense you know I mean those mm -hmm. t they come from sort of here's what they were doing and wow you know this is instruct you know here's one way to do it and here's another way to do it and here's a third way so yeah, yeah. um I just yeah, I think I, it, I think it was the word "thy" more than anything else. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I think that, that, that use of language, maybe. I think that may have just been a little bit of you know intellectual arrogance. On yeah, my yeah, I, I liked it. I like it. Anyway, <laughs> uh, getting back to the actual substance of it, I I, th I have a question that I think relates back to the earlier question somebody raised about charisma, but. Um, as I was reading, I was wondering, are there ways? And I think the answer is yes, but. You, you know it more than I do, whether uh, there are ways in which subordinates benefit from dominant individuals, uh, either through like indirect fitness benefits or being a member of the same coalition. Um, and um, at some point, I'd love for you to talk about banded mongooses, because I feel like they're a, they're a really fascinating example of uh, sure cooperation sure. and conflict between um, animals. Right. Yeah, so uh, uh, certainly, I mean, I, I, I think um, from a subordinate's perspective, um, there are benefits to be gained, both, like you say, indirect and, and, and direct. I think, you know, the, the direct ones are things like, uh, you know, Craig Packer's classic study on baboons, where you have individuals 
soliciting each other to join a coalition and um, one individual tends to be dominant in, 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 in that coalition. Um, when they get a coalition formed, um, they get access to, to, to uh, females to mate with, and it's always the dominant individual in that coalition that gets it. But the way that the subordinate is paid back is later on, if they try to form a coalition and they need help, um, the individual they helped is likely, um, is more likely to help them than you might expect just, mm -hmm. just by chance. And I think that goes on with the dolphin. The, the dolphins don't involve solicitation, but but you certainly have groups um, forming coalitions and, and, and coalitions competing against each other again for mating access there. Um, and so there are th those kinds of things. I think there are also these sort of um, interesting, more subtle, indirect ways. Um, there's some great studies I talk about where um, uh, in in, um, in 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 cichlids and in um, as well as in fairy wrens in Australia, where essentially in individuals subordinates pay rent, in a sense, to stay on the territories of dominant individuals. So these territories tend to be good because they you know because powerful individuals control them and they and they've gotten access to this good area. Subordinates provide something, food for developing young or extra protection or something like that. And, um, and, and, and um, Raul Mulder and, um, and, and Michael Taborski and others have argued that this is the equivalent of, of the subordinates paying rent. And in exchange, what they get is a nice, safe place for themselves until something better opens up. I mean, it's a dangerous world out there. Until you can get your own territory or, or something that you are striving for, it's good to be someplace that's safe. It's um, like protection money, right? It's yes, like, uh, you right. know... That's right. that's right. It's like you're. That's right. It's. It's. That's exactly what it's like. Um, and and I would say um, there are there are sort of other other even more subtle ways. So like Steve Emlin has done this fantastic work on um, white fronted bee eaters in Kenya, and there you get this bizarre thing where fathers often suppress the reproduction of their sons, which is sort of the exact opposite. What, what you might expect, you know, animal behaviorists immediately think when you have close relatedness like that, you get cooperation, but fathers suppress the reproduction of their sons under certain circumstances. And, it, and, and they're dominant to their sons as well, behaviorally. And it turns out um, when you kind of look at, when you measure the costs and benefits, it turns out that from the son's perspective, it's not really all that much worse to have your father suppress you and you stay home and you help your siblings, then if you were trying to go out and form your own nest, which is what father is trying to stop you from doing right now. Mm -hmm. And so there it's sort of a wash for the subordinate. They're not any worse, they're not any better. Father is better and overall it probably is a good system. Um, and then just one last example, again, this is perhaps sort of furthest away in terms of something that subordinates get directly, but there are a number of systems where when it comes to power, what the animals do, um, everything from cichlids to wasps, is they use natural landmarks to define territories. So in fish, it might be something like the natural vegetation and rocks. And, and what this does is it sort of minimizes um, the uncertainty about who's in control of what. If, 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 the, if the territory is really well delineated naturally by these landmarks, it's no one's uncertain about what the territory is. This obviously benefits territory holders, but it- Yeah, Lee, this, I have, to, I have to get in here because this, like to me, the best example of why you need this is like children in the backseat of the car. There isn't like a natural boundary and you have to put one there. You have to like put something down so that they stop fighting about who is on what side so you know if you're lucky enough to have one of those like little things that comes down in the middle you can put yeah. that down and the kids can stay on either side but if you don't have that it doesn't matter how big the back seat is they're going to be arguing about if they can put their arm right here or not yeah i mean i have a colleague in my department perry eason who's done some of this stuff um uh where she's looking at the equivalent of that in wasps and basically you know, she noticed that they seemed to use natural landmarks. So she went out to the backyard of this woman who was having this big wasp problem and she just tossed sticks out. And like within no time, the territories that the wasps form were sort of directly associated with the way that the twigs that she happened to throw down haphazardly were, were set up. This 
uncertainty, I think, benefits everybody. Um, or resolving the uncertainty yeah. benefits everybody. Exactly, exactly, yeah. exactly. Now, I don't know if we have time for me to talk about the mongooses, but if we do, I'm happy. <laughs> yeah, I, I just found it fascinating. So. I, I, I absolutely do, and I, I will leave it to Athena to say, do we Oh, yeah. Have- Okay, oh, oh, oh. give us give us the one minute version of the mongooses, right. and then we'll bring Jessica in. Yeah, so the the mongooses are incredible in the sense that you um, this is Michael Kant's work and, and a bunch of other people, um, a bunch of his colleagues, um, doing excellent work on this in, um, I think it's Uganda if I remember right, or no, maybe it's Uganda or Kenya. Kenya, I can't remember which one now. Um, but basically, um, you get these battle royales between mongoose mongoose groups where they where they just essentially line up and 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 they just go at it. And the way Michael describes it, it's like watching a, a, a big ball of fur where everybody is just going at it across these groups. But the thing that's so fascinating about it, in addition to just the, the level of antagonism, is that the way that these group battles start is that females in groups, groups tend to have a lot of relatives. And so females don't want to breed with their relatives. So what they do is they go over to one of these other groups and males from their group tend to follow them. And it appears as though what the females are doing is bringing those other males over with them. And when they're looking for mates in the other group, but when those other males come, it, it that's what causes the battle royale. And while the battle royale is going on, the females who have come over to that group mate with some of the males there. So basically it's this, from a female perspective, it's this giant distraction in terms of, um, that, that lets, it's, it's like a giant smoke screen that lets you go un, uh, under the smoke screen and mate with males from the other group, which would be difficult otherwise because the males from your group don't want you doing that that's the one minute version and there's so much more there's so much yeah (laughs) great well i think um it's about time for us to look to the future of um, these ideas about power and what the implications are for society and for the real world more broadly so here to chat with us about what this idea means and future directions is psychologist and evolutionary biologist, Jessica Ayers. Welcome, Jessica. Thank you for having me here. I've loved the conversation so far. (laughs) What are your thoughts about um, what we've been been chatting about? What has come up for you you as you've been listening? Yeah, the biggest thing that's really come up for me so far is that this idea that cooperation and conflict aren't necessarily these opposite interactions and kind of something that the poll had in there um, is that, you know, competition fosters cooperation. And so you can't have one without the other. Um, And that's kind of what I've been hearing resonate across all of the um, comments we've had, the questions we've had is that really these things they're happening together. And so it might be really important in future directions to really understand how cooperation can lead to conflict or how conflict can lead to cooperation. Um, And then when we think about humans, yeah. And when we think about humans, like we see that often, we see that warfare is inherently both conflictual and cooperative because you need a band that's going to work together to then engage in this conflict. Um, We see this in friendships that you can have a best friend or you can have a frenemy. There's always that like dual edged sword going on. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. 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 Jessica, what what are your most pressing questions kind of about the future of this idea or the, the broader social context of this idea? Um, so I've got a couple. <laughs> we'll try to fit them all in or as many as we can get to. Um, I think my biggest question though is in the book, we you talked a lot about how in these different species there's really like one or a few different strategies that animals could engage in to actually gain power. But in humans, we see that there are so many different strategies to gain power. Like if you look at the status literature, you see that there's dominance versus prestige. And so I'm wondering how we could leverage this perspective that we see in animals to maybe better understand what's going on in human interactions and human power struggles, I guess. Sure. Um, it's it's a great question, um, and um, you know it, it's one I thought about. Although I I I I steered I, I didn't really touch on that in, in the book per se because there was so much to say about non-humans. Um, uh, but I I I think I think there is probably there's at least one way that jumps to mind right right um, right away, which is 
and this is what I thought when, when I spent the first 20 years of, of what I was doing studying cooperation. One of the things that's so appealing about power is, is what you said is that, you know, there are different ways to get power even within a given species. But, but if you look across species and you see all of these, all of these different paths. So we've talked about some of them, but we haven't gotten to some of the fascinating ones. I mean, animals spy on each other. Right. Sword tails watch who wins fights and who loses. And they change how they behave with winners and losers to basically increase their chances of getting power. And you see this in, in penguins. You see it in so many things. So and you see animals changing how they behave in terms of power when they have an audience versus when they don't. You see animals going through this very sort of sophisticated way of, uh, of, of um, analyzing the potential power rivals. And so my sense is that what the non-human literature can do for us when you have things like power and cooperation is, is that you see so many variants and so much complexity in non-humans that what I would love to see is whether we can come up with some sort of integrative theory where we can basically try and understand why it is that we see certain types of power manifesting here versus there when there are so many options that, that, that exist in non-humans. If we could develop that kind of theory, we could apply it to humans. I mean, humans are incredibly fascinating, right? But at the same time, from a species level, it's an N of one. And, and, and what this does, because you have such complexity and, 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 and going on in non-humans, is it potentially is like this treasure chest of information that if we could somehow integrate it, it's complex enough that it really might have implications for humans. I mean, there are some kinds of human behavior that, that, that we might not be able to explain it by using non-human models, but I think a lot of it is, is possible. But I think we're still, you know, there's a long way to go on that. I think that that holds equally true for the literature on cooperation per se, but like you say, they're, they're integrally linked, but, but I think for both cases, that's true. I love that answer. Oh. Um, so Thank piggybacking you. off of that though, um, I'm wondering how we could also use this perspective to really motivate more cooperative or peaceful interactions um, in humans, but also in other species as well. Um, humans, you know, where sometimes we're a little bit more conflictual than we need to be. Um, and maybe it's really important for us to acknowledge that gaining power is a really important driver of human behavior, but how can we actually leverage that for more peaceful interactions or peaceful disagreements, um, either at an individual level, at a societal level, at a governmental level, um, anything like that. Um, and first of all, any, anytime anybody else wants to chime in, I, I'm happy, I'm happy to have you do so. Um, I, I think, um, that for, for me, one of, one of the, one of, one of the wonderful things about being a scientist is, is saying something like, that's a great question, but it is way outside my area of expertise. And, uh, and I don't think, you know, it's, I, I, I don't think I'm really in a, in a position where I can act, when I, where I can make recommendations with, with respect to human behavior. I think with respect to non-human behavior, basically what it comes down to is that the more that we understand the selective pressures, the more that how natural selection has shaped these behaviors, the more that in principle, we can use that information um, to facilitate less aggressive interactions, less power grabbing, at least with respect to the animals that um, we might encounter as the public on an everyday basis. So I, I don't know that we want to do that in, in natural settings, but Certainly in other kinds of settings, be it a kind of a, a, a reserve, um, you know, a wildlife reserve or, or potentially a zoo or any one of those things, understanding the selective pressures means that we can potentially manipulate those selective pressures. Um, and if we can do that, we can do it in a way that perhaps reduces the amount of aggression between individuals or between groups. Yeah, I think this is a, a really great big picture question. And, you know, I think some of the the ways that we can start 
you know, applying these ideas or, or, or thinking about how they might apply to humans is to consider, well, what are some things that, you know, might be unique to humans that we have to take into consideration that might be different um, than with, with other organisms? Um, I know, you know, one of the things that Lee and I have worked on some is this idea that, you know, as humans, um, and well, and Jessica as well, um, that, that we can have, like, you know, representations of our fitness interdependence with others, right? And to the extent that we understand that, you know, outcomes are really tied that, you know, I can't do well unless you do well, for example, um, then, you know, that can potentially help to reduce some of the um, competition or, you know, at least not frame things as zero sum when they might be, you know, positive sum situations. Lee, do you have anything you want to add about that? I want you to uh, chime in. I, I just, I'm sorry. I heard Lee and I mean, so yeah, th thanks. <laughs> yeah, I know it's confusing. Um, yeah. I was uh, thinking the exact same thing that Stina just said about zero sum game versus positive sum games is that, uh, the, the, that uh, we need to encourage situations that are positive sum where it's their win-win situations uh, and avoid ones that are zero sum, except where we want to have them because they can be fun like sports and recreational games are often structured as, as zero sum games. And that's okay in those contexts. But yeah, cooperation uh, is, is in principle easier to foster where you have a positive sum situation. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll leave it yeah. at that. Lee Degetkin, do you want to jump in? Oh um, no, I, I think I think what what uh, you and and Lee have said is is absolutely correct. Um, and I, I, I you know just coming back to something um, you had said initially, Athena was that 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 one way to come at this kind of from a different side is to ask um, not so much what are the commonalities because those can help us, but at the same time, what are the distinctive features? of human behavior um, because that might allow us to come up with even a sort of more integrative model that includes everything. Um, and, um, you know, I, I think also that um, one thing that might happen when we do that, that is sort of search for those things that are um, perhaps unique to humans is that um, Oftentimes things quickly fall off that list um, when you actually um, say, okay, so here's something I think that that's unique to humans with respect to cooperation. And, and when you take the time to actually say, here's exactly what it is, maybe even develop a model, a mathematical model, maybe not. But when once you do that and you really define it clearly, um, some somebody, I, I, I would bet, in, in behavioral ecology or animal behavior will tell you, you know, I think I saw something like what you're talking about here. And maybe, you know, maybe we should work on this together. And may, may, maybe it is unique to humans. Maybe it isn't. Either way, we can gain something from it. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Just, Jessica, do you have any other um, questions for Lee? Um. The one that's still stuck in my head is really just um, how can we kind of leverage this perspective to see the differences between more egalitarian methods of gaining power versus more like dominance oriented methods of gaining power and what that kind of buys cross species. Um, do we see that the ones that have more egalitarian methods have something tied to their food source and how they're able to get their food and that's what leads to the more egalitarian methods of gaining power emerging or are there other factors that we should be paying attention to? Because always in the back of my mind, I'm thinking like, okay, well, how do we apply this to humans to understand what humans are doing? Because like you said earlier, humans are interesting, but they're also a little bit infuriating because they're only an N of one. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, again, I, I think it's a good question. And I, I don't know that I have a, a great answer for it. I mean, you know, early on when colleague of mine, Michael Mesterton Gibbons and I long ago were, were sort of thinking about these kind of things from a, from a mathematical perspective. You know, one thing that, that jumped to mind was that um, this notion of, of, of a particularly harsh environment um, tends to foster cooperation. So what that harsh environment means is going to very much differ if you're talking about animals or if you're talking about humans. But just to give you, um, you know, sort of historical uh, component and Abe, um, you know, please jump in. I, you know, it, when 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 Huxley 
in, in Darwin's time, um, you know, Huxley basically argued that it that it was a dog eat dog world out there. And some people have said that's because he was a Victorian Brit to the core. And Peter Kropotkin, a Russian, basically saw cooperation and mutual aid everywhere. And that's because he was an anarchist and a socialist to the core. Um, and so I think, you know, um, it might be there might be something going on with with the notion that you know these harsh environments favor cooperation. Now, what to do with that is another question, right? Because um, you certainly don't want to foster harsh environments. On the other hand, you need to know that. Mm -hmm. If I may respond, uh, just um, and I want to apologize again for the landscaping. They may return, in which case I'll mute my mic again. But Neil has posed a good question, and since it dovetails so nicely with what you just said, I thought I would ask it, or rather read it. Does capitalism promote conflict over cooperation? Uh, so it, it bears on your conversation about Huxley and Kropotkin. So uh, what do you think? How would you respond to that? Um, are you asking me or Jessica? I'm sorry, I was asking you, Lee, but I, okay. I invite the entire panel to oh, okay. uh, uh, join in if they like. Hmm. I mean, it's a, again, that's, um, that's one that's pretty far away from, from um, something I feel like I, I can answer it, uh, um, in terms of expertise. But I, I would say at least from my historical um, reading on this, uh, you, you know, I, I don't think capitalism fosters um, cooperation kind of writ large. Um, so I think you're going to get some cooperation when individuals need to work together to, to build a company. But, but, um, but I think the larger dynamic is basically competition between whatever it is that people cooperate to produce. So again, we're seeing that, you know, that, that, that these are very difficult things to, to separate um, cooperation and, 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 and striving for power. But, um, you know, my general sense is that um, capitalism per se does not, does not promote cooperation at a kind of societal level, although it might at a, at a micro level. It's sort of a set of like formalized rules for how you compete over resources. In yeah. A way. Yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, and, and again, just for a little, a little quick history story, very quick. Um, so Adam Smith, you know, the wealth of nations often thought of as kind of the, the father of at least free market thinking. And many people would, would, would argue capitalism. Um, Adam Smith um, was actually somebody that people who studied cooperation in animals um, often turned to because one of the things that Adam Smith um, had argued was um, a, in a separate book from The Wealth of Nations in this book called, um, oh, I'm blanking on the name of it, um, uh, but I, I bet uh, Abe might come up with it. Um, the, the Theory of Moral Sentiments, that's it, The Theory of Moral Sentiments, argued that that we are empathetic. And by being empathetic, we can take the position of what others are feeling. And people who study non-humans, particularly at that time, Peter Kropotkin, a Russian scientist, argued that animals have that sense too. Um, and, and that empathy is, 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 is really important in non-humans and in humans. And, and in general, that's going to foster cooperation. Now, that doesn't necessarily specifically address capitalism, but it does address this kind of border between uh, humans and non-humans. Great. Well, thank you so much, Abe. Thanks so much for giving us a historical dimension here to, to this discussion. Um, it's been great to have you here with us. Um, Lee, thanks for giving your perspective as well. Um, Lee Kronk, that is, <laughs> thanks for being with us today. Um, Jesse, uh, thanks for giving us this perspective to the future. Awesome having you on the show as well. And Lee, thank you so much uh, for, for being with us today. It was a, a real pleasure to get the chance to, to talk with you. Is there anything that you want to leave our audience with before we say goodbye? Well, first of all, I want to thank you and I want to thank all the other panelists. I, I, re I really, really enjoyed this. Um, 
I, I think we covered almost everything that, that, that I was hoping to say. Um, I will give a plug to um, ASU, Arizona State University's incredible program um, that basically covers all the things that we're talking about. So if you're a student and you're thinking of some place to go, um, you know, Arizona State University is-, is, is Come join my lab. Absolutely, and, and Athena, <laughs> Athena, Athena is great. To, um, you, you'd be doing a lot of, you'd be doing uh, cutting edge work in, in lots of fields. So, um, no. You. Otherwise, it was just, um, it, it was just, it was just a pleasure, and um, I enjoyed the science. I enjoyed the um, back and forth, and um, I rarely get a chance to display my do not disturb collection. <laughs> <laughs> that was awesome. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you. And just I'm going to remind everybody, definitely check out the book, Power in the Wild. It's um, Lee Allen Begatkin's newest book, but he has also so many other books that I'm sure you will also want to read once you get a, a taste of um, reading his work. So Lee, thank you so much for being on the show with us. My pleasure. Thank you. And thank you to all of you for joining us. That just about wraps it up for our second Cooperation Science Network live stream. Um, keep your eye out. Um, we'll be talking to Nicola Rayani about her book, The Social Instinct, on May 24th at 11 a.m. Eastern time. So until then, we hope you all enjoy engaging with the most scientific cooperation and the very best cooperative science. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter. Um, tag us when you tweet about your cooperation research and also subscribe to us on this YouTube channel. You can hit that button right now um, and don't forget to like our show as well. We will see you all next time. Thank you for being with us. <laughs>